Good afternoon, and welcome to the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center. My name is Susan Derwin, and I am the IHC Director. As the public face of humanities for the campus, the center runs programs that draw upon the expertise, practices, and skills associated with the humanities to support scholars in the production of new knowledge and to empower community members as agents of social change. We are delighted that you're attending the inaugural lecture of our public events series, Too Much Information, which throughout the year will be exploring the impact and the implications of living in the information age. TMI will also take up questions of access to and discrimination, excuse me, dissemination of information, including the question of the, how the suppression of knowledge poses a threat to democratic governance. For those of you who are in the McCune Conference Room today, I want to encourage you after the, after the talk to check out the artwork in the foyer in the platform exhibition space. These works have been inspired by and are responding to this year's TMI series, and I want to welcome and thank the artists here today who are included in the exhibition. Thank you, artists. Finally, before we introduce our speaker, I would like to acknowledge the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center is located, and I would like to pay respect to elders, past and present, as well as other indigenous people present. And we are delighted and fortunate to have Wolf Kittler as the inaugural speaker of the TMI series. Professor Kittler studied German and Romance languages and literatures at the University of Freiburg, Germany, he is Distinguished Professor of German and Comparative Literature at UCSB, and he has also taught at many other in universities, both in Europe and the United States. Professor Kittler has written books and essays on literature, art, philosophy, the history of science, the history of warfare, and media theory from antiquity to the present. His recent publications are on topics ranging from impressionism as an effect of the chemical dye industry, to the history of the Greek alphabet from Euripides to Plato, to the origins of gymnastics in the German War of Liberation against Napoleon. Currently, he is working on a manuscript entitled On Wings of Light, A Cultural History of Telecommunication, and another manuscript, Echoes, Echoes, from Freud to Lacan. We will be taking audience questions at the conclusion of his presentation. Our online audience can submit questions to our speaker at any time through the question and answer function on your screen, and our in-person audience members can raise their hands, and we will bring a microphone to you and thrust it into your fist. A recording of this event will be posted to our website in the near future. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Wolf Kittler to present his talk, Too Much or Too Little? Thank you, Wolf. Thank you, Susan, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, it's, uh, I was a little bit hesitant to give it because uh, to inaugurate an event is a heavy burden. In ancient Rome, it was a solemn and highly regulated ceremony performed by the augurs, a small college of priests whose office consisted in prophesizing the future from the flight from the feeding and from the screeching of the birds. The augurs were part of every undertaking, public or private in Roman society. They determined matters of war, commerce, and religion. They sanctified the temples, and they installed the priests. Taking in that sense, the inaugurating lecture that Susan asked me to give cannot rise to the occasion. All I can and know how to do is to read the traces of a long past. But the augur's real job, their office of interpreting the will of the gods, their power to predict the future, I will have to leave to those who will contribute their ideas and their knowledge in the series after me. I hope that they will be able to tell you how we can deal with all the information, all the data that are being gathered in our time in the near and perhaps in the distant future. If I may, I would like to start with a few personal memories. I grew up in former Eastern Germany. There was no phone. 
Urgent messages, which were rare, arrived via telegram, sent to the post office in Morse code, and delivered to our house by the postman. But in our house, stashed away in a storeroom, there was a large library. As a child, I had no doubt that my father, who had collected all these books, had read all of them. I just assumed he had. And I've spent most of my life catching up. And when I decided to write a dissertation at the University of Freiburg, Germany, I was told that a doctoral thesis must give a complete account of all the literature published up to this moment on the topic I would choose. I made the mistake of writing on Franz Kafka, an author on whose work I was told about 10,000 books and articles had been published at the time, and I'm sure there are more now. To this day, I've always had the awkward feeling that there was too much inform information out there and that I did not know enough uh, that I had too little information. Of course, we all know those bleak moments which the first line of Malame's poem, Ocean Breeze, inv invokes. The flesh is tryst, alas, and I've read all the books. But we also know that there are many books, as librarians like to point out, that have never been read. I still remember my initial he hesitation and then the uneasily giddy feeling of transgression when I grabbed a knife to cut open the pages of a specific volume of Charles Fourier's collected works, a book had, which had been published in the 1840s and remained unread for more than 100 years up to that very moment of my time. This was, of course, but one copy owned by my alma mater, and I'm sure that others had opened other copies elsewhere. Information overload in those days, the 1960s and 70s, and in my field of study, the humanities, was tied to books. And the cutting and pasting I did when I finished my dissertation was still done with a real scissor and with real glue. All of that has changed. The other day, I was the only one in a waiting room who didn't stare at a screen but was still reading a book trying to catch up on information. Time to think about the history of what we now call information. Time to think about the long trajectory from the earliest recording and data retrieval systems to digital media, to the digital media of our time. Time to think about the history of numbers and letters. Going back to what Plato calls the uncreated beginning, I quote a few passages from Pyotr Michalowski's article on Mesopotamian cuneiform. I quote, what is probably the first known writing system in the world, conventionally called proto-cuneiform, was used in Mesopotamia at the end of the fourth millennium BCE in the latter part of what is known as the Uro period. The major majority of Uruk archaic texts are administrative documents, these comprise texts dealing with such matters as animal husbandry, land, animal and personal management, and the processing of fruits and cereals." End of quote. In order to fulfill that function, the proto form system comprised not only symbols that we would now call or classify as linguistic, but also numerals. However, about 15% of the remaining texts, and here I quote Michalowski again, are not economic. These are lists of words arranged by systematic class and by sign design, commonly, commonly known as lexical files, lexical lists, sorry. There are lists of wooden objects, professional names, fish plants, and other subjects. These differ from the accounts in a number of aspects. They are preserved in multiple copies, as many as 163 for the professional list. Some duplicates were found outside Uruk, and they were copied by later scribes for hundreds of years. 
These lexical texts have been interpreted in a variety of ways, but most scholars agree that they were manuals for the teaching of writing. This demonstrates that from the beginning, there was a concern for the structured trans transmission of the system from generation to generation, and that the method of instru instruction was passed along with the practical knowledge of the script. And I'm going to show you two of these lists. You see how they are uh, organized in columns. A similar phenomenon occurred, occurred in ancient Greece after someone had adapted the Phoenician alphabet, uh, sorry, the Phoenician abjet, which consists of 22 consonant letters only, leaving the vowels, the vowel sounds implicit to the phonetic transcription of ancient Greek by redefining some Phoenician symbols as vowels rather than consonants. We do not know whether this distinction between vowels and consonants was a misunderstanding or a conscious choice, but we know that some of the earliest texts found in, on Greek pottery are of two types. A witty allusion to the story of Nestor's cup in Homer's Iliad, which was so heavy that only his owner, Nestor, could lift it, found on a drinking vessel in the ancient city of Pitecusae on the island of Ischia in the Gulf of Naples, on the one hand, and numerous shards showing the Greek alphabet on the other. Again, we have what Michalowski calls the structures transmission of the system, but instead of administrative texts, we have, we have pottery, a hexameter referring in both content and meter to Homer's Iliad. Based on this admittedly scanty evidence, Perry Powell has concluded that the Greek alphabet, the prototype of our Latin ABCs, was explicitly created in order to record Homer's songs, however, not by the illiterate Homer himself, but by an anonymous adapter who created the Greek alphabet out of the Phoenician abjad. If this is true, and I should add that not everyone, everyone buys Powell's hypothesis, then Homer's epics are, remarkably, are a remarkably double-faced document, full of technical details that cannot be attributed to a single archaeological layer. They testify to a long and deep tradition of oral culture in which information was passed on, on from generation to generation carried along and stabilized by two techniques, a set of formulaic phrases and the repeating patterns of a specific meter, the hexameter in Homer's case. It is a tradition that was still alive in the 1930s in the Balkans when Milman Perry of Berkeley and his student Albert Lord studied and recorded the songs of the so-called Guzla the singers of oral poetry in the servo croat language, refuting thus, once and for all, the Enlightenment prejudice that the sheer length of Homer's epics must necessarily exceed the capacity of a single human's memory. Yet the length of these epics marks not only a milestone in our understanding of oral poetry, but also one in the history of phonetic writing. As Robert Fowler, in his introduction to the Cambridge Companion to Homer, observes tongue-in-cheek, like countless others, there are moments when I think that this stupendous masterpiece produced the better part of 3,000 years ago, fountainhead of Western literature, and in many people's view still its greatest work, is simply a miracle serious argument for divine intervention in human history. And Barry Powell in his article on Homer and writing notes a paradox. Immensely long poems recorded in writing near the time when writing for historical Greece begins, virtually the same writing which supports the writing on this page. The Iliad and the Odyssey mark the beginning of phonetic poetry in Western Europe. And the fact that these texts have been preserved so completely over more than two millennia 
is an enigma in itself. I quote the introduction to the exhibition Homer in print. The earliest surviving example of Homeric papyri is from the third century BCE, about the time that scholars in Alexandria produced a relatively stable text that was subsequently used to scribes, by scribes to produce copies. Over 1,000 manuscripts of Homer's work exist, from far more than for any other ancient author, and many more of the Iliad than the Odyssey." End of quote. There is, apart from short quote, quotations in other texts, not a single written trace of Homer's work for half a millennium after they were recorded in the 8th century BCE. Nonetheless, about 300 man medieval manuscripts of the Iliad or the Odyssey serving, survive, dating from the 9th to the 15th century. A stunning testimony to the painstaking and meticulous work of an innumerable set of an anonymous scribes who must have copied these texts over and go over for more than a thousand years, a time in which information was scarce because what they produced were not reproduce, reproducible copies in the modern sense of the term. Each manuscript was one of a kind. And reading and writing were highly specialized techniques, techniques mastered exclusively by a small and secretive community of scribes. For an early example, I quote a passage from the long Sumerian poem, poem Emarka and the Lord of Arata that dates from the 21st century BCE. Quote, this was his message, but it, its meaning was lost. The words were too difficult for the messenger, so he could not repeat them. The king of Kubala applied his hand to clay and stamped the message as if with a seal. Before that time, no one had ever written down words on a tablet. But now, on the sun of this very day, indeed is what it was so. The messenger takes the tablet with him and once again tackles the road to Arata. He presents himself before the local ruler, and then the narrator informs us that the king of Arata received the tablet on which all was recorded for him. The king of Arata looked at the tablet. The spoken words seemed like nails. The king of Arata looked at the tablet on which all was recorded for him. Pyotr Michalowski, after whose work on the correspondence of the kings of Ur, I quoted this passage, comments, the symbolism of the episode is self-evident, but also includes a critical absurdity. It is obvious that the letter is useless unless it has a recipient, but one never doubts that the addressee can read, or in Mesopotamia, that the messenger who carries the letter can read it to him or her. The letter is in plain sight, but cannot be understood. And I should mention that the uh, formal, formula of, the, uh, of letters in this time in the cuneiform writing is always go to such and such and say this and this. So it's basically the letter tells the messenger to, to read the letter out. The real message of the newly invented Sumerian letter, Michalowski continues, is clear. It heralds the superiority of literate Mesopotamian civilization, much to the despair of the highland king who must recognize the inferiority of his own culture, which had no writing and no letters. For the scribes who taught the Sumerian poem in school, as well as for their pupils, this passage must have carried additional meanings as they would recognize their own power as writers and readers for nobles and kings, many of whom were illiterate and needed them for access to written communication. Nor can this story be dis dissociated from the similar ideological tale of the origin of clay envelopes for letters, which, similar to the story recorded above, was embedded in a tale about another pair of ancient kings, Urzabad of Kish and the future ruler of Agade named Sargon. And once again, a quote from Sumerian. In those days, writing on tablets already existed, but the enveloping of tables did not exist. 
So King Ursababa for Sargon, the creature of the gods, wrote a tablet that could cause his, i.e. Sargon's, own death, and dispatched it to Lugal Zagesi in Uruk. Michalowski comments, here the envelope is invented in order to hide the contents of the epistle from the eyes of the messenger, since the letter contained instructions for the recipient to murder the carrier. Thus, a letter can kill, transgressing the separations imposed by mimesis, écriture becomes potential deed, and fiction is subordinated to the murder's dagger." End of quote. The story, as you might have recognized is, recognized, is told as is retold as that of David, Uriah, and Bathsheba in the Hebrew Bible and in the Bellerophon episode of Homer's Iliad. A variant is the post-Homeric Homeric myth of Palamedes, one of several figures in Greek mythology said to have invented writing. All of the great Athenian tragedi tragedians Aeschylus, Euripides, and Sophocles wrote a tragedy about his face. Only a few fragments of these texts survive, but we know the plot from the fables of Hyginus. Ulysses, because he had been tricked by Palamedes, son of Nauplius, kept plotting day by day how to kill him. He writes a fake letter in Priam's The Trojan King's Name addressed to Palamedes, promising him a great quantity of gold if he would portray the camp of Agamemnon according to agreement. The gold is planted under Palamedes' tent. The letter is intercepted. The gold is found, and Palamedes is stoned to death. I quote the longest fragment of Euripides' version of the myth, obvious part of Palamedes' defense against these false allegations. Quote, Palamedes, on my own, I established remedies for, for forgetfulness, consonants and vowels by creating syllables. I went at writing for man's knowledge. So a man absent over the ocean's plain might have good knowledge of all matters back there in his house, and the dying man might write down the size of his wealth when bequeathing it to his sons, and the receiver knew it. And the troubles that afflict men when they fall to quarreling, a written tablet does away with these and prevents the telling of lies." End of quote. This is how you can, of course, deceive yourself. Of course we can lie writing. See the fake letter that did Palamedes in. But otherwise, Palamedes is right. Writing is a remedy for forgetfulness. In other words, a storage medium, and as such, it carries information over space and time to people overseas and even over the threshold between life and death. In other words, it is a medium of transmission. Plato, who is supposed to have attended Euripides' tragedy Palamedes when it was staged at the 19th Olympiad in the year 415 BCE, when he, Plato, was 12 or 13 years old, distorted Euripides' simple and unambiguous formulation into a paradox that has puzzled readers since then. In his dialogue, Phaedrus, the god Toit, under whose name Palamedes returns in Egyptian garb, claims to have invented writing as a, as a remedy, or to be even more precise, a drug for wisdom and memory. As far as I know, we take medicine when we are sick, when something goes wrong, which is why our Euripides metaphor is perfectly fine. But I do not think that wisdom and, wisdom and memory are illnesses, obviously not in need of prescription medicine. Plato turns Euripides' formulation on its head, creating a paradox. Not a medicine for forgetting, as in Euripides' Palamedes, Writing, and here I quote Plato's Phaedrus, will bring about forgetfulness in the souls of its learners from the lack of practice in use of their memory, inasmuch as through their reliance on writing, they are reminded of things as a result of alien impressions which are from outside and not from within themselves by themselves. 
you have found a drug not for memory, but for reminding hypomnesis. End of quote. No doubt that Plato is ironic, but behind his Socratic iron irony, there's a program. The claim that true wisdom and true memory, the anamnesis we all have of the eternal ideas, is not a given. It is something we can only love, not simply in the form of the spoken voice, as Derrida would have it, but through the gaze of the beloved person's eyes, the gateway of love, memory, and wisdom, the gateway of philosophy. Writing is good for remembering our life on earth, not for the ascension to the realm of ideas that is the highest form of memory, anamnesis. Never mind, of course, that Plato himself was a prolific writer. It is one thing to question the use of writing overall, but quite another to find the right information you might need. At a time in which what we call books were volumes, that is, scrolls, and in which texts were handwritten with no spaces between words, no interpunction, no distinction between capital and lowercase letters, and sometimes even boustrophedon, that is, alternatively from left to right or from right to left, at such a time, you could not just browse a text and find one piece of information you wanted. Uh, this is a papyrus manuscript of uh, uh, Sophocles Antigone. And you see the red letters is what you see there. And you see, of course, uh, there are no spaces, uh, all in capitals. There are no diagrams or signs and so on. Uh, and you also, but you also see that uh, someone has corrected uh, the kappa and the nu, where there was a she two she's before. So somebody has made a correction there. Uh, but you see how difficult this is to write, to read and to write. The codex, or what we now call the book, cut up sheets bound together in the back, invented in the Roman Empire, and widely used by the early Christians for editions of the Bible, facilitated data, data retrieval considerably. Now you can browse or peruse a book by simply paging through. That way you could find passages in what they call the Old Testament, directly referring to passages in the second half of the book, the New Testament. This is called figural reading. Another device for early data retrieval are tables of content. One of the first to use this new information technology was Pliny the Elder, who in what John Henderson has called this rage for order, explained the purpose of this technology in, his, in the preface to his natural history, which is in the form of a letter addressed to Emperor Vespasian, and I quote, as it was my duty in the public interest to have consideration, consideration for the claims upon your time, I have appended to this letter a table of contents of the several books and have taken very careful precautions to prevent your having to read them. You, you, by these means, will secure for others that they will not need to read through them either, but only look for the particular point that each of them wants and will know where to find." End of quote. For a long time, however, books neither had a title nor page numbers, but only rubrics from Latin rubrum, red headings of sections and paragraphs marked in red ink. One of the first data retrieval techniques in medieval manuscripts are alph alphabetically ordered concordes of the Bible indicating not page numbers, but the relevant chapters, chapter numbered by the system devised by Stephen Langton and the section of the chapter as in Langton's seven part divisions labeled by letters A through G. And I think this is what you have here. No, actually, this was the right uh, thing. Of course, you see the uh, red rubrics right there. And the next slide shows you the, uh, the Bible concordance. So you have uh, uh, alphabetically listed quotes, parts of quotes. And it starts always with, with the word on A, and to the left you have the references. So if you uh, are going to uh, write a sermon, 
you can just go through these lists and kind of can find the passage in your Bible uh, that uh, the context of that. Finally, there is the index that lists references not just to one book, the Bible, but all the books someone like Robert Grosteste has read in his lifetime. And this is a table by Grosteste. Grosteste devised a system of notation which would allow him to group subjects together along with a set of references, essentially keywords which would be used across disparate texts. Rather than being an alphabetical system, the tabula divides its subjects into nine categories or, or distinctions which are themselves divided into a varying number of subcategories or topics. By way of example, the first distinction is in, entitled to De Deo or On God. Beneath this heading is a list of 36 topics, each of which relates to its parent category that God exists, what God is, the unity of God, the trinity of God, and so on. The first part of the tabula is simply a list of these distinctions and topics, 440 of them. Alongside each, Krostas has designed a symbol, symbol but unique to, the, to that topic, so that in the course of his reading, whenever a particular topic comes up, he can quickly jot down the symbol in the margin for later reference. And uh, the, uh, the fourth symbol, the triangle is the fourth symbol for Trinity. Uh, you can find similar uh, a similar system actually in Walter Benjamin's uh, notes on for the Passagenwerk. As the following sl slide shows, Gossets um, also made alphabetically ordered annotations, and you can see this. So on the left, you know, all with A and then goes to B and C on the right. So he ordered his annotations alphabetically. Uh, but the time of annotations as we know them today, i.e. footnotes, starts with Richard Stuck's Calvinist edition of the Bible from 1572, where they are in fact not foot, but rather alphabetically referenced marginal notes. And that is this Bible, and uh, I'm just gonna show you, this is uh, footnote A, this is footnote B, and then C, D, E, and so it's on the right side. Page numbers became standard around the same time. At first, they are canonical finding aids for bookbinders, as in Arnold Terhernan's edition of Werner Rolewing's book, The Presentatione Beate Maria Virgitatis, Cologne, 1470, in which all the retro recto pages are numbered sequentially. Uh, a note, and this is what I'm showing you now, on what we now would call the, the bastard title, admonishes the binder not to take the order of the copies lightly. This is the underlined text that, that's a note to the uh, book binder to take care that uh, all the sheets are, or, are in the right order. And the, the right order is taken by uh, giving on the right margin of the recto page uh, the number. This is number one. The most famous example of the early use of numbered uh, sections in a book is Aldus Manutius' edition of Niccolo Perotti's book Cornucopia, a 700-page encyclopedia of the Latin language, which was published in Venice in 1513. Here's the title page with the emblem of Manutius' motto, Festina Lente, Make Haste Slowly, where the dolphin stands for speed, and the anchor stands for uh, the slowness, the stability. And here's the last page, which uh, is really interesting. This includes the colophon with the printer's names and date of publication, all the, the, also the register, a list of the sections as a guide to the binder. This is the, these are the alphabets down there. Uh, note the use of numbered columns. So the, the columns are numbered, not the pages rather than the pages and the guide, letter, the guide letters for illuminated uh, initials. So you have here this empty spot with a C. That's where the, uh, the initials painter is supposed to put in a beautiful uh, painted initial. Note also the use of italic as a type text type. Italic is named italic, of course, after this type by Aldus Manutius from Venice. Books like these mark a new area in the history of data storage and retrieval, the age of the movable letters of the Gutenberg press. 
It was a time of great amazement, but also of great worry, because soon enough, things got literally out of hand. Take the canons of the Dome of Regensburg, for instance, who in the year 1585 checked the copies of their missile produced from a single printing block with eyes which, up to that time, had only seen manuscripts. Here's the, the Bishop Heinrich von Absberg's description of the event. And after the completion of the typesetting and the printing, we had the printed text checked, read aloud, and again perused by outstanding experts, clerics of our dome. And lo and behold, the result was, like a miracle of God, that in the letters, the syllables, the words, the sentences, the periods, paragraphs, and everything that pertains to it, this printed text matched our dome's originals in all the copies and in each and every aspect. For this, we thank God. <laughs> but as I said, like all things new, the new technology also created new voice. Martin Luther, for instance, opened the introduction to his translation of the Bible into German, I have to say the New Testament, which was first published in 1528 with the following urgent plea. I beg all my friends and enemies, my masters of art, printers and readers, to let this New Testament be mine. If they are in want of one, however, then they should make one of their own. I know quite well what I'm doing, and I see clearly what others are doing, but this testament shall be Luther's German testament. For there is now neither an end nor a measure of all these smart-mouthing and pontificating. And everything shall be warned of our other copies, for I have learned quite well how lazily and wrongly we are being reprinted by others. It was also take about, it would take about two centuries before attempts were made to solve this kind of problem by copyright laws, the first of which was the British Statue of Anne issued in 1709. But, all we, but we all know how difficult it can be to enforce such laws. I, for one, was quite happy when our library lifted the copyright for all the materials on Hathitrust during the COVID-19 crisis for almost two years. I know this was a difficult time in many respects. In this respect, however, it was paradise for me. No more waiting for interlibrary loans, a few keystrokes, and everything I wanted to read was on my screen. I wrote several long articles in this time because I had so, so, such a great access to it. Books. Commenting on the adage Festina Lente, the motto of his publisher Aldus Manutius, for whom he had worked also as a proofreader, Erasmus of Rotterdam asked a pointed rhetorical question. To what part of the world have not books flown in swarms? If this was a complaint about an overload of information, Descartes had a solution to the problem. In his essay on the search for truth by natural lights, Descartes writes, I quote, it is neither necessary that an honest man has read all the books, nor that he has carefully learned everything that is taught in schools. Suffice it to note that even if all sciences we can wish for were enclosed in books, where it is mixed in with so many useless things and scattered all over a mass of such large volumes, it would take longer to read these books, those books, than we have to live in this life, and more effort to select the useful things than is necessary to find them ourselves. End of quote. Here, in the shadow of the devastating 30 years religious wars, Plato's lover of wisdom, who is always in dialogue with his beloved friends, is replaced by the lonely philosopher of modernity who meditates, as Descartes says in his first meditation, in peaceful solitude. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, arguably the most obsessive Aramite philosopher, phrased it much more passion passionately and with a clear reference to the Platonic, Socrates, the Platonic Socrates claim that, I quote, the logos which is written with intelligence in the mind of the learner 
is eminently superior, eminently superior to words written in ink on papyrus. I quote a passage from Ono Rousseau's Emile. I hate books. They only teach us to speak about things we don't know. They say that Hermes graved the elements of all the sciences into columns to shelter them from a deluge. If he had imprinted them into the head of humans, they would have been preserved there by tradition. Well-prepared brains are the monuments within, within which human knowledge is the most securely preserved. Immanuel Kant, who defined enlightenment as self-thinking, self-thinking, suggests that we should wean ourselves from books when we want to really grow up. I quote from his answer to the question, what is enlightenment? It's so easy to be immature. If I have a book to serve as my understanding, a pastor to serve as my conscience, a physician to determine my, to determine my diet for me, and so on, I need not exert myself at all. I need not think, think if only I can pay. Others will readily undertake the irksome work for me. As an example of such a successful act of self-thinking, Kant gives, uh, in, in his essay on, uh, on the conflict of the faculties, he gives an, an, uh, you know, an, an example, and the title of this example is On Overcoming and Preventing Morbid Conditions by a Resolution About Drawing Breath. Eine Entscheidung, eine Resolution, Atem zu ziehen. In which he describes how he cured an annoying nightly cough by making the firm philosoph philosophical resolution to simply keep his mouth shut while sleeping. This cure had an additional advantage. As Kant explains, I quote, I found that the sheer force of resolution has even further results. Once after I had put out the light and gone to bed, I suddenly felt an intense thirst and went in the dark to another room to get a drink of water. While I was groping about for the water pitcher, I hit upon the idea of drinking air through my nose, so to speak, by taking several deep breaths and expanding my chest. Within a few seconds, this quenched my thirst completely. The thirst was a pathological stimulus which was neutralized by a counteracting stimulus. Those were the days when smart people could still be experts in all academic disciplines. <laughs> About a century later in a speech on the relationship between the natural sciences and science in general, Hermann von Helmholtz could only invoke the famous line from Sophocles Antigone when describing the situation of the sciences in his time. Many things are terrible, but none more terrible than men. Helmholtz continues, we can still grasp the enormous activity in all the different, sorry, who can still grasp the enormous activity in all the different academic disciplines as a whole? Who can gather together all the threads of relations and still, fi still find this way? The natural consequence of this situation is that each individual scholar is forced to choose an ever-shrinking area as his own field, field of study, only being able to, remain to retain incomplete knowledge about neighboring disciplines. Now we are inclined to laugh when we hear that Kepler in the 17th century was hired as a professor of mathematics and morals in Graz and that at the beginning of the 18th century, Boerhaave at the University of Leiden held the chair for botany, chemistry, and clinical medicine within which pharmacology was, of course, included, all of it at one and the same time. Nowadays, we need at least four at universities with, which, that cover all the disciplines, even seven to eight teachers in order to cover all of these areas. And the situation is similar in other disciplines. That was the diagnosis, diagnosis, sorry. That was the diagnosis in 1862. In 1944, Erwin Schroeder came to a similar conclusion. I quote, we have inherited from our forefathers the keen longing for unified, all-embracing knowledge. 
The very name given to the highest institutions of learning reminds us that from antiquity and throughout many centuries, the universal aspect has been the only one to be given full credit. But the spread both in width and depth of the multifarious branches of knowledge during the last hundred odd years has confronted us with a, clear dile with a queer dilemma. We feel clearly that we are only now beginning to acquire reliable material for welding together the sum total of all that is known into a whole. But on the other hand, it has become next to impossible for a single mind fully to command more than a small specialized portion of it." End of quote. Today, as far as I know, all the work in the sciences is collaborative. Only humanists in the so-called book disciplines keep indulging in self-thinking. And one wonders how long they will be able to sustain this kind of work, or perhaps even their discipline. So much on the effects of the printing press. Another great institution founded not long after Gutenberg's invention of movable letters is not so well known. I mean the torn and taxes postal system founded in the early 1500s and expanded all over the Holy Roman Empire by Emperor Maximilian. The family had the privilege to build and entertain a network of relay stations where postilions could refresh themselves exchange horses, pick up mail and packages, but also passengers. The word taxi, derived from the family's name, should remind us that in those days, the transfer of information, freight, and people was still carried by one and the same medium, usually moved along by means of, or if it was truly urgent, on equine feet. And it took quite some time before people understood that there's a fundamental difference between freight and passengers on the one hand and information on the other. As an example, I quote Heinrich von Kleist's article, Project of a Mailing System by Bombs, by Bombs. Implicitly referring to Samuel Thomas von Sömering's essay on an electrical telegraph that had just been invented and published, Kleist writes, in order, in order to further traffic within the confines of the four parts of the world, an electrical telegraph has been invented. A telegraph which by means of the electro four and metal wire transmits news with the speed of thought. That is to say, in less time than any chronological instrument can register and in such a manner that provided all the necessary installations were otherwise in place, if someone wanted to ask a good friend whom he had among the antipodes, how are you? In a turn of the hand, and just as if we were standing in one and the same room, that friend could answer quite well. As much as we would like to give the crown of merit to the inventor of that mail, which, strictly speaking, is riding on the wings of the thunderbolt, this art of riding at a distance is nonetheless still imperfect in so far as it is not very beneficial to the merchant's interest because it can only be used to send brief and laconic messages, but is of no use when it comes to transmit letters, reports, attachments, and parcels." End of quote. There's a remarkable discrepancy between the precision with which Kleist describes the effects of the new medium and his ultimate critique of it. As if the fact that messages could now be sent at about 80% of the speed of light were a disadvantage. Now we know that we need both, Amazon and UPS. The word telegraph is a neologism coined for the French semaphore, semaphore system that was invented, built, and managed at the turn of the 18th to the 19th century by Claude Chap and his brothers. Soon overtaken by electrical system, it survives to this day in the form of railway signals and traffic signs. The speed at which the Sharp Telegraph had carried, had carried Bavaria's call for help against the invading Austrian army to Napoleon's Paris in the spring of 1809 was one of the inspirations for Semmering's Telegraph. I'm gonna show you this. But the decisive idea of the invention goes back to Kant, 
who in response to Semmering's claim that the soul might be located in the brain liquid, had countered that the soul by its very nature cannot be located, but that what we call thought might be nothing other than the action of the newly discovered physical process of electrolysis within that fluid. The phenomenon of electrolysis, which literally shattered the time-honored idea that water is a primary element, indicates, of course, not thoughts in Sommering's telegraph, but pairs of letters. Using more convenient types of coding, the new medium of electrical telegraphy rapidly spread throughout the world, creating new jobs and new opportunities. In April 1850, Julius Reuter, a Berlin book publisher who was involved in distributing radical pamphlets at the beginning of the revolutions of 1848, started a news and stock price information service using carrier pigeons between Brussels and Aachen, Germany, using 45 trained birds. There was a telegraph gap of 76 miles between Brussels and Aachen, the birds were sent each day by rail to Brussels, and they flew back to Aachen with the information. Their flight only took two hours, much quicker than by rail, and it worked well. This continued until the telegraph gap was closed in the first quarter of 1851. Soon enough, however, and this is the end of the quote, all the gaps between different telegraph networks were being filled, including the gap between Europe and North America, which was closed shortly in 1858, and then again more permanently in 65. Less than a half a century later, on December 12, 1901, Marconi sent the first radio signals over the Atlantic Ocean. It was Summering who, after several failed attempts to measure the speed of which, at which signals were passing through long lines of wire, said that they must be traveling at the speed of thought and then in order to measure that speed, one would have to measure the speed of the lightning bolt. Exact measurements by Armand Fissot and Léon Foucault finally determined that C, the speed of light, light in vacuum, equals about 300,000 kilometers per second. When we look at the sun, we see light that was emitted about 18, eight sec seconds ago. And when we look at distant stars with ever more sophisticated, sophisticated telescope, we can absorb the, observe the origin of the universe. Albert Einstein, inspired by his work on time synchronization systems in the patent office of Bern, Switzerland, came to the conclusion that if the speed of light is finite, and as, Michelson -Morley, as the Michelson-Morley experiment had shown, constant in every reference frame, then we have to rethink what we mean when we say two events are synchronous to one another. Time and space are not separate entities. They are a unified entity of space and time, the four-dimensional space-time continuum. Engineers had a different problems. They needed to know how efficient telecommunication, telecommunications channels could be. Ralf Hartley's paper on the transmission of information, published uh, in 27, 1927, argued that in order to develop a quantitative measure of information which is based on physical, contrasted with psychological considerations, one first had to el el eliminate these psychological considerations. I quote, to illustrate how this may, may be done, consider a hand-operated submarine telegraph cable in which an oscillograph recorder traces the received messages on a photosensitive tape. Suppose the sending operator has at its, his disposal three positions of a sending key, which correspond to applied voltage of the two polarities and no applied voltage. In making a selection, he decides to direct attention to one of the three voltage conditions or symbols by throwing the key to the position corresponding to that symbol. The disturbance transmitted over the cable is then the result of a series of conscious selections. However, a similar sequence of arbitrarily chosen symbols might have been sent by an automatic mechanism which controlled the position of the key in accordance with the results of a series of chance operations, such as a ball rolling into one of three pockets. End of quote. 
hardly suggests to take as a practical measure of information the logarithm of the number of all possible simple sequences. Thus, the best way to find a quantitative measure of information is the extreme case of a random process like the successive results of a roulette game, the movement of the molecules in an ideal gas, or a random series which, according to Shannon's paper, a mathematical theory of cryptography is the only possible means to construct an unbreakable secret code. This is the reason why Shannon, in his mathematical theory of information, ends up with a formula of which he says, and I'm going to show the formula, uh, quantities of this form play a central role in, the information, in information theory as a measure of information, choice, and uncertainty. The form of H will be recognized as that of entropy, as defined in certain formulations of statistical mechanics, where PI is the probability of a system by being in all I of its face space. H is then, for example, the H in Boltzmann's famous H theorem. Let me exemplify Shannon's formula briefly with Hartley's little roulette machine where a ball is rolling, rolling into three holes. So you have uh, three cases, uh, one case where uh, all uh, three choices are uh, equal, one third each. And you have another case where only one choice, basically no choice, it's always one. And you see the information is zero. And there the information is 1.59. And uh, the meeting case, one half, one third, uh, one six, you see it's between zero and 1.59. Um, the case in the middle is, of course, uh, a model of human language. Noise, which add, adds uncertainty, increases the quantity of information. Shannon showed that each choice from a given set of information can be broken down in a sequence of yes, no, or on-off choices where the entropy is either zero or one. And that should be clear. So one if you have equal choice, and of course zero if, you, if the, there is no probability. Uh, the uh, Shannon showed, yeah, and uh, I'm going to show you this here so you can break uh, something like the uh, graph on top uh, down into um, a, a graph where, you know, at each point you have a choice between two options. Uh, and this, of course, recurs in the uh, one half, one, uh, one half. Uh, as, as, as factor and one half in the other age. Uh, and this expl ex uh, equation explains, of course, why the binary logarithm is the most convenient quantitative measure of information. Uh, so much about the math. I'm not going to talk about this more. Quite a few scholars in the humanities have criticized Shannon's theory because in their reading, it eliminates meaning, the center of their expertise, when he writes, I quote Shannon, the fundamental problem of communication is that of reproducing at one point either exactly or approximately a message selected at another point. Frequently, the messages have meaning. That is, to, they refer to, to or are correlated according to some system with certain physical or conceptual entities. These semantic aspects of communication are irrelevant to the engineering problem. The significant aspect is that the actual message is one selected from a set of possible messages. The system must be designed to operate for each possible selection, not just the one which we will actually be chosen since this is unknown at the time of design." End of quote. It has to be said that these critics, criticizing uh, Shannon for not talking about meaning, never got beyond the first equations in Shannon's paper. For in his comments on these equations, Shannon writes, and I quote again, the ratio of entropy of a source to the maximum value it could have, while still restricted to the same symbols, will be called its relative entropy. This, as will appear later, is the maximum, maximum compression possible when we encode into the same alphabet. One minus the relative entropy is redundancy. The redundancy of ordinary English, not considering statistical structure over greater distances than about eight letters, is roughly 50%. This means that when we write English, 
Half of what we write is determined by the structure of the language, and half, half is chosen freely. Two extremes of redundancy in English prose are represented by basic English and James Joyce's book, Finnegan's Wake. The basic English vocabulary is limited to 850 words, and the redundancy is very high. This is reflected in the expansion that occurs when a passage is translated into basic English. Joyce, on the other hand, enlarges the vocabulary and is alleged to achieve a compression of semantic content. The inventor of basic English, C.K. Ogden, an English linguist and philosopher, had produced a recording of James Joyce reading part of Anna Livia Proabella section in what he called his work on progress on his novel, Finnegan's Wake. And I actually have a, a link to this, but I will not play it. Uh, on this occasion, Joyce told Ogden he would be interested to see how the effects he was aiming at in work in progress might keep be conveyed in the 850 words of Ogden's basic English. Ogden's translation was published in the March 1932 issue of the journal Transition, a tribute to Joyce's work with contributions from the creme de la creme of the literary and artistic avant-garde of the time, among them to name but a few, Eugene Adjet, Samuel Beckett, Constantine Pancusi, George Brack, Ernest Hemingway, Pablo Picasso, and Gertrude Stein. In the, introduction, in the introduction to his translation, Ogden writes, the last four pages of Anna Livia Proabella by James Joyce have been put into basic English, the international language of 850 words in which everything may be said. Their purpose is to give the simple sense of gra the gramophone record by, made by Mr. Joyce, who has himself taken part in the attempt. And the reader will see that it has generally been possible to keep almost the same rhythms. In this way, the simplest and the most complex languages of man are placed side by side. And you see this is uh, Joyce and Red is Ockner. And you see that uh, in, on average, Ockner's uh, lines are a little bit longer. Uh, sorry, yeah. As you can see, yeah. So much not only about Shannon's understanding of semantics, but also about his familiar, familiarity with avant-garde literature and art, and it, but it's, because it's clear he's quoting Ogden from this uh, publication. In February 1948, about halfway between Ogden's translation and Shannon's theory of communication, Jorge Luis Borges published a short review in the journal El Sur titled A Fragment on Joyce, in which, first of all, he talks about one of, of his own works in progress. I quote, among the words that I did not write and which I shall not write, but which justify, justify me in whichever mysterious and rudimentary way, there's a story of about eight to 10 pages whose exuberant title is Funes the Memorias. At the hero of Funes desperate, someone explains, the deceased was perhaps the only lucid man on earth. His perception and his memory were infallible. We at one glance can perceive three classes on a table. Funes, all the leaves and tendrils and fruit that make up the grapevine. He knew the forms of the southern clouds at dawn on the 30th of April, 1882, and could compare them in his memory with the mottled streaks on a book in Spanish binding he had once handled in his childhood. Of the magical body of my story, one can say that he was a precursor of the Superman, a suburban and partial Zarathustra. He is undisputably a monster. I've brought him to mind because the continued and right reading of the 400,000 words of Ulysses requires similar monsters. I will not even venture to say anything about those required by Finnegan's Wake. End of the quote. The story, which Boris did in fact later write and publish, is a play on the difference between what the mathematician Georg Cantor called the set of numerable numbers, like the natural numbers, for instance, and the set in, uh, of innumer in, innumerable numbers, the set of real numbers, for instance. According to Borges, Nietzsche's postulate of the eternal return of the same is based on the first one of these two sets. In his essay on the doctrine of cycles, he writes, the number of the atoms in the universe is finite, although beyond measure, and as such only capable of finite, though also beyond measure number of permutations. 
In an infinite time, the number of possible permutations might, must be reached, and the universe must repeat itself. Borges juxtaposes Nietzsche's postulate of the eternal return with Cantor's reflections on the concept of infinity. Quote Borges, the series of the natural numbers is well ordered. That is to say, the terms that compose it are consecutive. 28 precedes 29 and follows 27. The series of points in the universe or of moments in time cannot be ordered in this way. None of its numbers has an immediate successor or predecessor. The friction, the friction between Cantor's play and the beautiful play of Zarathustra is mortal for Zarathustra. If the universe consists of an infinite number of terms, then it is rigor, rigorously, rigorously capable of an infinite number of combinations, and the necessity of the eternal return is defeated. Irene of Funes, the vernacular Zarathustra, has such a good memory that he does not need the decimal system. He can, he can attach an arbitrary word or name to every number, but around 20,000, the numerous he, he creates get ever more complicated. Why? Because the vocabulary of any human language is finite. He runs out of words and is thus forced to create a positional system which is based on the exact same principle as our binary, decimal, or hexadecimal systems. The only difference being that the base of Funes system is a much larger but nonetheless finite number. Consisting of a large number of discrete and hence countable elements and their permutations, Funes numeral system is a language, or to be more precise, our language. Like Borges himself and many others, and I quote, he had learned English, French, Portuguese, and Latin without effort. He, I suspect, however, that he was not very capable of thought. To think is to forget differences, generalize, make abstractions. In the teeming world of Funes, there were only details almost immediate in their presence." End of quote. Funes, I would claim, is not a monster, not an exception. He is every man. We all live in Cantor's continuum. We are forced to, we, we all live in Cantor's continuum and we know it. But as soon as we try to say or understand what we experience, we are forced to use the discrete, countable units of the language we speak. We remain trapped in Nietzsche's universe. Just like the Turing machine, we can count the countable set of the natural numbers, even if we will never come to an end, but we cannot even start counting the real numbers. And I'm coming to the conclusion. This brings me back to Shannon's theory of communication, which start out, starts out with the following statement. The recent development of various methods of modulation such as, such as PCM and PPM, which exchange bandwidth for signal to noise ratio, ratio has intensified the, in, intensified, sorry, the interest in a general theory of communication." End of quote. PCM, pulse code modulation, the principle of MP3 files, cell phones, and other applications, cuts the continuous stream of acoustic waves we emit when we speak or make music into discrete or digital units, one and, series, one and zeros, as they say, but more precisely, sequences of on-offs in relay and switching circuits, to quote the title of Shannon's legendary MA thesis, on the symbolic analysis of, of relay and switching circuits, 1937. In the introduction to this paper, Shannon writes, the method of attack may be, described, may be briefly described as follows. Any circuit is represented by a set of equations, the terms of the equations corresponding to the various relays and switches in the circuit. A calculus is developed for manipulating these equations by simple mathematical processes, most of which are similar to ordinary algebraic algorithms. This calculus is shown to be exactly analogous to the calculus of propositions used in the symbolic study of logic, that is, in Boolean algebra." End of quote. In the 1940s and 50s, when such circuits were used to compute the effects of nuclear weapons or to crack the secret code of the German military, assemblies of such switches were enormous. The electronic numerical integrator and computer, also known under the acronym ENIAC, for instance, contained 7,500 7, vacuum tube tubes linked by 500,000 soldered connections 
It filled a 50-foot long basement room and weighed, weighted 30 tons. After the discovery of semiconductors in the 1950s, these switches are now called transistors, and their density has increased exponentially. In 2017, uh, the journal IEEE Spectrum reported that Intel now packs 100 million transistors in one square millimeter. As the size of their components was diminished, and as the distances between these components were decreased, microchips could perform more and more calculations in less and less time. One of the many effects of this new technology, and the one most relevant to my field of study, the humanities, was that the data, data retrieval systems invented by people like Robert Grosstest and perfected by printers and publishers in the 15th and 16th century could now be automatically processed by computers. It was the genius of Lawrence Page and Sergey Brin, the founders of Google, to have grasped this opportunity. In their seminal paper on the anatomy of a large-scale hypertextual web search engine, they write under the heading PageRank, bringing order to the web, the citation, brackets, link, graph of the web is an important resource that has largely gone unused in existing web search engines, end of quote. In his book, The Search, John Battelle explains, quote, academic publishing is a flawed but useful system of peer review incorporating citation and annotation as core concepts. The system produces a ranking methodology for published papers. Fair enough, so what's the point? Well, in short, it was Tim Berners-Lee's desire to address the drawbacks of this system via network technology and hypertext that led to its creation of the World Wide Web, and it was Larry Page and Sergey Brin's attempt to make Berners-Lee's Berners World Wide Web, Web better that led to Google. The needle that threads these efforts together is citation, the practice to point to other people's work in order to build your own. Which brings us back to the original research Page did on backlinks. He reasoned that the entire web was loosely based on the premise of citation and annotation. After all, what, is, what was a link but a citation, and was the, what was the text describing that link but annotation? End of quote. What once was known as reading was now called crawling. The excerpts gathered by the crawler were called backrub, and course tests reverse index index was now called page rank. Conclusion. The motto of Francesco di Tasso, founder of the taxes, ta Torn and Taxes postal system, is a quote from Cicero's book on the ends of good and evil. Habio quod dedi, I have what I gave. And you can see it here in the left in this winder thing. It's in the church of Notre Dame du Sablon in Brussels. This is a maxim that could apply to Google, Facebook, and many other IT companies as well. What they created is a great gift. Without Google, I could have never written this talk and not, none of my essays. But now, they have what they gave. They are privy to our most secret desires and fantasies, just like the postillions of the postal system created by Louis XI uh, in 1477 in France, must have been aware of the complicated affairs and intrigues in Laclos's novel Les Liaisons Dangereuses, or like the telegraph girl in Henry James' story in The Cage, who despite the fact that she's not able to crack the code of Lady Bradeen and Captain Ever Everard's secret messages, knows everything about the ups and downs of the affair because she can, do can deduce it from the metadata of their telegrams. Returning to our current situation, let me quote Shannon's comment once again. The form of age will be recognized as that of entropy as defined in certain formulations of statistical mechanics. Age is then, for example, the age in Boltzmann's famous age theorem. Today we know that rather than merely stating a formal analogy, this comment pinpoints a serious problem of our time. By simply and seemingly innocently exchanging information, we are burning huge amounts of energy. It is as if we had carried the natural tendency of life to its extreme. 
The tendency which Erwin Schrödinger in his book What is Life defined as follows, I quote, what an organism feeds upon is negative entropy, or to put it less paradoxically, the essential thing in metabolism is that the organism succeeds in freeing itself from all the entropy it is producing while alive, end of quote. In our rage for order, we are spreading disorder all over the place, the little planet Earth. Each climate simulation, each Google search, and each PowerPoint presentation contributes, if only a negligible amount, to global warming, changing and perhaps destroying thus the conditions of the possibility of organic life. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your talk. Um, my name is Tejas, I'm from the Classics Department. Um, so I enjoyed all the manuscript stuff. Um, something I've been wondering about is as we uh, sort of move forward into just so much data being out there, and now Google is sort of, there are all these you know, functions to organize information based on how much people are paying for it, to be there, and all that sort of stuff. So our access to it isn't just paywall problems anymore. So I'm thinking like as we sort of move forward and this problem of information becomes a sort of, it's, it's already a post-human problem, and like it will become, it has become, I think, a trans-human problem where we, as, as we sort of move forward, it's like it exists on its own, and we humans have so little control over how it's being produced, and it's like automatically being produced in so many cases. So I'm just sort of wondering your thoughts on this, like is it, is there so much that it's uncontrollable? Is it now in this state of just, you know, excess that will never be uh, harnessed again, or what do we do with all this info? Uh, I'm not sure I can answer this question uh, in this generality that you are asking it. And I, I have to admit first, as I said, for me, Google is paradise because I don't have to, you know, and I don't care. I've, uh, you know, I really find this, I could never have, I mean, most of these quotes I found through Google searches. I, you know, like uh, that Shannon is quoting from this Arkham translation. I had no idea I found it through Google. So, I mean, it's really amazing. And I think it will change our, our discipline considerably. I think it has already, but uh, a lot of people don't seem to really uh, understand what it, what it really means and uh, one has to think about this. But um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think in the, in, in the natural sciences, it's, it's, it's much worse. Because uh, as far as uh, what I've been told is that you know, there are data from satellites that are sitting somewhere, and nobody has ever uh, been able to analyze them and so on. It, that's probably true. I don't, you may know more about this than I do. Um, so. I don't really know. I don't know. Can I ask a follow-up? Sorry? Um, a follow-up. Sure. A follow-up uh, to that is uh, the question of expertise then. So if all of this information is accessible, is there room for experts? And as like citizen science becomes more of a thing, especially during COVID, everyone was doing their own research. So how do we sort of put those together? Well, as I said, and, 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 and again, I'm. I'm on the wrong side there because I'm, I'm in the book discipline. I'm a self-thinker, uh, and rarely in my life have I collaborated, and it was not always very uh, successful. So uh, I envy the people in the sciences that you know. It seems to be. I don't know. If I was in, on a committee here that looked at people's uh, 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 research and so on, and I was pretty impressed that. Um, the, um, a lot of, several of our colleagues in physics are moving into biology, for instance, and so on. I find that, of course, you know, you have that already in, in Schrodinger's uh, book from 1944, but uh, I, I think there is no other way than uh, expertise. Uh, you've seen it in, in Kant. I mean, Kant's conflict of the faculty is really about uh, we don't philosophy is on top of everything. And as a philosopher, I can heal my nightly cough. 
I just have to be a stoic and have the right ethics and so on, and I can do it. And, but that's over. And, uh, and, and Helmholtz, Helmholtz does not talk about collaboration. And, but now it's, it's the norm, I would say. Right? And I don't know how this really works, because I'm not in this field. So. Other questions? I'm curious what your thoughts are on the accessibility of information, given the fact how most disciplines, and even UCSB as its whole, is trending towards a w way of accessing information where if you do not have access to a smartphone or Wi-Fi, you don't have access to this whole like web of information. I'm curious on your thoughts about that very drastic divide between too much information and no information. Yeah, and of course, uh, it's not just UCB, right? I mean, uh, we're talking about our situation, and we know that uh, there are lots of uh, countries where this is very different. different. Um, one thing. Uh, That maybe is not a direct answer to your question, but something that I actually had to cut. I noticed that my talk was too long anyway. Um, is that um, we're so proud of uh, being alphabetized. This was something that happened uh, in Europe in the early 19th century, and I think here a little bit later. But of course, we are now alphabetized, but we are completely a digitized. <laughs> there are only a very few people who understand how this stuff works. Uh, that uh, I find <laughs> particularly uh, disturbing. That's, uh, you know, I mean, one thing is, of course, you know, that uh, certain uh, people and countries cannot afford even the stuff that we have and that we can use. Uh, but uh, who in this room uh, can read machine, uh, can program machine code? I'm just asking. <laughs> Okay, so, but that's fine. That's about it. That's a very, that's just not alphabetization, right? I don't think, I'm sorry, this is probably a, a kind of a, a escaping your question, but I, I just wanted to say this. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. That was really uh, brilliant and, and, uh, and wonderful. Uh, this is a, a sort of cross between a question and a comment and an answer, a, a kind of weaving of, of things. Uh, it maybe begins with Isocrates and uh, an observation about knowledge and food. That just as we need to feed the body, we need to feed the mind everything that the body needs or the mind needs. That goes to the argument about the humanities and, and specialization, that you know, up to a certain point people could know everything, but then they can't. And then there's a fallacy that because we can't know everything, we should only know one thing. That's, that's a mistake, you know, because if there were a feast, no one would think that either I can eat the entire feast or I should only eat salad, you know, because you, you would still want to eat everything that you need, not everything in a mouth, but everything in kind, which I think we, we do, and I think you demonstrated actually in the, in the span of your presentation, you know, from, from, uh, from uh, you know, Akkadian to Greek to all the way to, the, to Shannon and so on. Um, okay, so that's, that's one little framing. Um, the next part is to do with maybe the, the next chapter to, to what you were presenting which is the same argument about too much or too little, but with now artificial intelligence and machine learning. And in particular, something right now called diffusion, which is that you take, let's say, a picture of a dog, and you replace it with one with noise, and more noise, and more noise, and more noise in a systematic way. And then you train the, the AI to go from noise back to the dog. You know, you kind of reverse the process except that you do it a billion times with dogs and cats and words and everything in the world and until you create a huge cloud of noise. It, then, if you can prompt it 
you, you say, you know, I want a dog on the moon. You're basically tickling this cloud and, and asking the machine to find its way back to produce this image that never existed. The thing is, it's a little bit like Google and what you're saying. You delight in it, but a lot of people have it and don't even see it. The same thing with this cloud. If you ask it cliches and stereotypes, it'll give you cliches and stereotypes. And so you need to know how to nudge it, which needs you to know more things than one. Right? It, needs, it needs to have this uh, scope. And then one last thing, because uh, you mentioned uh, uh, the, the effectively, well, you mentioned Funes, the memorials, for his. Uh, I actually had the strange good fortune to meet the Rain Man, Kim Peek, you may know, this person who never forgot anything. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. I actually met him, and he was giving a talk over a library. Wonderful, strange, but wonderful person. And I got to talk to him. And I asked him if he knew Funes the Memorials, the story. And he did. And he didn't. Oh, he did. He didn't. He, he knew he knew all sorts of things. He hadn't seen that book, so he didn't. And <laughs> so I had the time to run downstairs, buy the book, and give it to him as a present. And I'm still wondering. I never met him again, so I'm wondering if he actually made the connection about uh, being able to think, you know, or whether he just memorized it and didn't understand. Well, you know, of course. Uh, a person like that uh, may not forget anything, but it doesn't mean that uh, he remembers the continuum, right? He cannot remember the continuum, right? I mean, that's the whole paradox in, in Borges' story, right? The, the narrator goes to Fudis uh, in this memorable night. The narrator says memorable for him. <laughs> And Funes tells him everything about his memory, but it's all in language. And so, of course, and the narrator can understand it. <laughs> That's why he's, they are on the same level, right? They are not uh, in, the, uh, in the continuum. So that's uh, this thing. Um, and in that sense, um, I, I know that uh, there are essays about uh, this person, this obviously incredible, this person with this incredible memory in Funes. I haven't read those, but um, I know they exist. Um, and all the other things that you said, well, uh, I, I agree that uh, you have to know how to use these tools. Right? Uh, I mean, maybe that's a trivial formulation of what you said, but I think I have a great advantage because <laughs> I spent about 30 years of my life working with uh, indices in books, and it was a pain. <laughs> it, was, you know, it was very hard to find stuff, and sometimes you forgot and quote, and then you had to read uh, a whole novel again because you had forgotten this one quote. This was horrible. Now, of course, <laughs> all, all the quotes that are kind of vaguely in my head, I, I find them immediately. That's great. Of course, it's, uh, you know, because of this, I had to read some novels three or four times. That's maybe not so bad either. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I think, of course, we need to be, try to be as expert as we can, but there are definitely limits. And what you said about uh, the, the uh, uh, artificial networks, I remember, and because I don't know much about this. I will just quote uh, uh, someone whose name I unfortunately for, cannot forget at the moment. Get out your smartphone. Hmm? Get your smartphone out and Google. You know, I, I, do, I, I bought one today. I usually don't carry it along when my wife calls me, uh, rings in our drawer. But, uh, but um, yeah, from Caltech, who was at our conference on the Pacific, and he actually said that um, uh, these uh, neural networks cannot really produce new stuff. And I just take that as what he said. Well, yeah, but, no, but, but it, it, it creates, of course, it creates a dark that you've never seen, right? You know, it creates a dark that you've never seen. That's that's clear. But but I mean, what he meant by this is really, 
uh, that uh, I think he wanted to, he's working on climate simulation models. And for him, this is a big difference because the climate simulation model does not just feed on existing dogs and then uh, produces a dog out of uh, some nebulous uh, uh, cloud there out of which dogs can be kind of uh, uh, distilled. Uh, he is really trying to make predictions of complex future systems. And I, I, I think this is something different, but. I know very little about it, so I cannot really talk about this. It's a fascinating question. I'm, I'll just I won't respond as much as I would like. But yeah, we can it's, talk. No, it's, it's just too long. But, but, it, but it, it ties directly to your talk when you, when you were speaking about Cantor and, and infinity and the countable and the uncountable. It doesn't, for humans, for finite creatures, it doesn't matter if it's infinite. It just needs to be so much bigger than we are to be effectively infinite. So, so you, you run a computer, and it doesn't know everything, and it, it's actually quite predictable in its own way. Of course. But the combinatorial space that it's in is so much bigger than we are that it'll still surprise us. It may still figure out that storm. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, I don't know if you, if you did this on purpose. If you're, you're quoting Turing's essay on computing machine and intelligence, yeah. where he says, you know, everything is... Uh, uh, deterministic and the machine, nonetheless, it's so complex that they surprise me all the time. I'm going to jump in here and thank you for this unbelievable journey you've taken us on through the history of information.